Good evening, everybody. How you doing? Good. Welcome to the final installment of our race and ethnicity conference for this for today for Tuesday. Uh, we have plenty of other things happening Wednesday and Thursday, but I'm very happy you're here. I, I am uh, also very happy to be able to introduce the newest member of the social science department here at Grand Rapids Community College, and uh, Dr. Dylan Carr comes to us uh, with several degrees. He has a Bachelor of Science in Archaeological Studies from the University of Wisconsin at La Crosse. He also has uh, two master's degrees, both in anthropology, one from University of Western Ontario and another from Michigan State University. And finally, and most recently, uh, he was awarded his PhD in anthropology from Michigan State University. So obviously we're very, very Happy to have him with us. He brings a wealth of knowledge and experience and uh, some youth to our department, which is, which is very welcome. Uh, he also wanted you to know that he's a great guy and uh, the department would be very, very well served if we offered him tenure. So I <laughs> thought I would uh, just put that plug in on, on video. Uh, his talk tonight is Grand Rapids and the People Without History the historical landscape of the city of Grand Rapids. So without further ado, Dr. Dylan Carr. Thank you, Steve. Is that loud enough? Can you hear me? Good. Can everybody hear me back there? Awesome. I think the only reason I was hired was for youth, because I think uh, Professor Light, who's the chair of the department, wanted me for his baseball team. I think that's kind of what the conversation. And his softball team. So. That pays off. This, if so, if, if academics doesn't work out, at least go into softball. That'll get you a job at some place. Um, and so uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, so I'm glad that my students turned out, even though I didn't force them. I'm, I'm telling you that right now. Um, is anybody here from a different class where they're getting extra credit for being to my talk? Awesome. <laughs> How much extra credit am I worth? I always want to know that when I, I give a talk. Five? That's not bad. Uh, anybody giving me more extra credit than five? 25 points. That is definitely the most extra credit I've ever gotten. Uh, what class is that for? PS110. PS110. Awesome. So I'm, I'm now up. I think the highest I've ever gotten. Am I? We get extra credit. <laughs> you get to do an assignment for my class, and then uh, you get credit for that. It's not exactly extra, though, unfortunately. But uh, for the PS110 uh, students, 25 points is a lot. So that's great. Unless there's a ton of points in the class, then it's, it's all relative. Um, anyways. Uh, just sort of, of, of getting going a little bit. I'm just gonna try to touch upon a number of different uh, topics within this talk. Um, although within the title of, of my presentation is a discussion of history and the history of Grand Rapids, um, I'm really gonna take a more of an anthropological focus of history. Um, and I'm gonna talk about really the production of history and really how does that relate to issues such as race and ethnicity um, right here in, in Grand Rapids. I'm a relative newcomer to the city of Grand Rapids um, and so, and, and one, in some ways, that makes this type of talk a little bit challenging because I don't have really a depth of a lot of local history. But on the other hand, um, it really serves me pretty well for taking an anthropological focus on the history of Grand Rapids in the sense that I can come at it from an outsider's perspective and looking at the, the dynamics and some of the patterns and structures of, of historical production here in Grand Rapids that individuals that have grown up and, and been uh, born and raised within the city often are not aware of with, with these patterns that come about because we get socialized within a particular social context and oftentimes it's very hard for us to step aside from that social context and sort of look at it from, from outside within. Uh, with that said, I'm not going to give a historical, uh, um, I guess, narrative about Grand Rapids. Rather, I'm going to talk about the importance of history uh, within Grand Rapids as it pertains to the interaction between uh, individuals of different race and ethnic um, um, groups. Actually, I'm, I'm going to start with the, a narrative of, of really where this talk started from. Um, when I moved back down to Grand Rapids back in August, um, I had the, the fortune of, of going to uh, talk by, was given here on GRCC's campus by Dr. Ronald Ferguson, um, who is a professor at Harvard University, who's talking about the, the achievement gap within American schools. And predominantly, he's focusing on the achievement gap between African American students um, and really predominantly white students within various school systems out there. Um, it was an excellent talk. Anytime you get the chance to hear really, really smart people talk, jump on it. Um, and Dr. Ferguson certainly is, is um, an individual that I would put up there on, on that. And so he gave a really good talk talking about um, 
sort of the, the dynamics of educational systems, not just here in Grand Rapids, but throughout the United States, um, focusing on a lot of issues and a lot of barriers that um, face a lot of individuals of, um, of visible minorities within the school system, and talking about the structures of the educational system, and, and offering solutions of, of how we can do better to sort of close that achievement gap, which is really um, one of the themes for the Race and Ethnicity Conference is how do we deal with these, these persistent gaps between uh, racial and ethnic groups, and really what comes back to it, and Keith St. Clair right before my talk talked at the end, was education. Um, and education really is the focal point, and that's one of the things that uh, Dr. Ferguson was talking about. Um, but on the way out of that talk, um, my fiance and I were walking out, and we're behind two individuals, two teachers presumably, since everybody um, within the, the talk I think was, was some part of the, the Grand Rapids public school educational system. Um, and I overheard a conversation. Um, so how many of you love to eavesdrop on conversations? Just raise your hand. All right, good. The most hands raised on, on any of these. Um, I'm an anthropologist, so I, I, I'm a pro at it. So I can, I can do it legally, I guess. Uh, and so I was eavesdropping on this conversation. It was between a, a white male teacher and a white female teacher. Um, and the white male teacher basically was puzzled with something that Dr. Ferguson had ended his talk with, which was he was talking about test scores and really looking at the, the difference of test scores between more of the inner city schools, and this is a pattern that shows up in every single major urban area, not just Grand Rapids, um, where there's generally lower test scores within a, in an urban center, um, and generally higher test scores among some of the, the better funded um, school systems that are located on the suburbs or the periphery of school systems. Um, and so because of that, he was saying that you can't just simply focus on the test scores because what you need to do is break that data down to look at where students are learning the most. Because it turns out that a lot of really good students end up going out to these very, very good schools on the, the outskirts of town and they really don't improve their test scores being in the school system. So if you want to find out where the best teachers are, you have to look for where the best learning is. Uh, problems with that measurement aside, what he was focusing on was looking at the, the differences between um, the, the generally uh, predominantly urban schools and the more suburban schools. Um, but with that said, we still see persistent differences between schools within those two geographic locations. And so the white male teacher who was walking out, I don't know his name since I was just eavesdropping, um, really made a, a question, because he was puzzled about really where was the source of that difference in the quality between urban schools and suburban schools come from in the first place. And he was struggling with that. So he was talking to the person that he was um, alongside of. And, but what I don't understand is where do those differences and really what I put in, in, in blocks here is, is inequalities. That's what he's talking about, the differences in equal, equal education between urban and suburban contexts. And school systems come from the first place. He really was grasping at that. He really had no historical basis to really understanding that. Um, and his, his companion's response to that, um, in which they, they seem to both be trying to struggle to put this into a broader historical context, was I think because the parents only send their kids to good schools, it creates those differences. Um, and again, I'm focusing on inequalities, shining some light on the subject. Um, that's, from my perspective, is an ahistorical explanation for this. That's really a descriptive or a description of the problem. The problem is students that have opportunity, the students ha that have really the economic capacity to direct their students towards more suburban schools where they feel they're going to get them a better education, do so. It really is a description of what is going on but it doesn't explain really what the, the origins of those inequalities were in the first place. In other words, the explanation was removed from history. Um, and so I was walking out and I wanted to say something, um, and, but I realized that it would probably take me an hour of explanation and that's this uh, pair of individuals probably would not appreciate me stopping them and giving them an hour long lecture. Um, and so today's lecture really is my response to these two individuals and their conversation. Um, which, so you guys get to endure my hour-long response to, um, to this particular question. But what really, really what I want to focus on is not so much the achievement gap within schools, but what I want to do is uh, talk about really where does the context that individuals that presumably are members of the local community um, trying to deal with and are probably good-natured individuals that want to legitimately have an answer to that question, where do these structural differences between schools come from in the first place? are incapable of answering it within a historical context. There has to be some sort of process that occurs in order for this phenomenon to occur within that. With, because these, guys, these two individuals are teachers, they presumably have college degrees, and so they're educated individuals within the community, and they still lack that historical per perspective on really what is the nature of inequalities here in Grand Rapids. 
And the reason why I'm talking about inequalities in Grand Rapids and a race and ethnicity conference is that it shouldn't be surprised to any of you that inequalities between groups of people, and really in any part of the United States, and in particularly major urban areas, those inequalities are drawn about along, his, or, uh, along racial and ethnic lines as well. And so what I'm talking about is what an anthropological concept known as structural inequalities. Um, and so what I'm talking about is not individual actors in history. I'm not talking about who the first founder of the Grand Rapids public school system was. I'm not talking about who the, the, the most prevalent or the most awarded teacher within the Grand Rapids public school system is. I'm not talking about when Wyoming public schools or Caledonia public schools were founded in the first place. Those are all bits of history where we could talk about different actors moving into the history, but the structure of those relationships between the urban centers and the suburban centers that doesn't change. You can change the actors, you can change the presidents of the school system, you can change the individual teachers within those school systems, but the structural relationships between those schools that produce those inequalities in the first place does not change. Um, and that's part of the issue of why we want to take this historical perspective. Because if you just simply focus on individual actors that are moving in and out of, of really sort of the stage that is, is Grand Rapids education, you miss that structural perspective. And that's what those two teachers were trying to deal with, was understanding where does these structural inequalities within society come from. And what I mean by that is really that some groups in our country are afforded differential access to all sorts of different elements, whether it's income, whether it's good paying jobs, whether it's uh, someone's dignity, self-respect, uh, legal protections, uh, individuals, no matter who you are and what your particular race or, or ethnic heritage may be, um, ha afforded sort of the dignity of not having to endure being pulled over by police officers at random. Um, those are elements that are built into the structure of the system themselves. We can have individual actors playing out their roles um, of enforcing those structural inequalities, but if you change the actors, if you eliminate that discrimination, that prejudice that produces those actions, you still do not change essentially the exploitive power relationships that are engineered into society. Um, and what we tend to do is we tend to ignore them, we don't see them, because you need to take that historical perspective in order to see how these structural inequalities come about in the first place. Um, and without recognizing the action of structure, then you really can't understand an appropriate approach to being able to deal with it and decreasing those gaps between one individual to another individual. Uh, to tie in with uh, Professor St. Clair's talk, uh, to give you an example of how structural inequalities operate, uh, we have a picture of a favela outside of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and so engineered into Brazilian society is this distinct difference in social class and opportunity that is really dictated on where you're born in Brazilian society. Uh, so in this case, if you're born and you're growing up in a favela on the outskirts of, of Rio de Janeiro, I think one of the, the questions was focusing on um, sort of quotas that are to the public school system um, at, at universities in Brazil. And that uh, if you're growing up in one of these settings, you're really not going to get prepared to succeed in the universities, even if you get in in the first place. And more drastically than that, if you grow up in a favela in some of these areas on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro, chances are you're not even going to graduate from middle school or high school. And chances are you're going to end up in some sort of exploitive gang context um, or some sort of, of, of element within the, the drug trade or being funneled into more or less an informal economic sector, sector where you're removed from public life. That's your fate that's sealed to you, not because of who you are, but where merely on the fact of where you happen to be born within. You are no more capable of becoming a CEO of a company if you're born in a favela. In a favela. That's a structural inequality, because a group of people, based on simply the exploitive social relationships around it, have their fate sealed for them. And likewise, if you're born in an upper class setting within that Rio de Janeiro culture, you have opportunity. You have access to wealth, power, and prestige within that society that is not afforded to any individual that's born within a favela. And that's a distinct structural difference between one category of people and another category of people. Simply by virtue of where you happen to be born within and no other elements such as talent, intellect, work effort, or anything like that. You can remove all those out the door because all it is is engineered into the structure of that society. 
And those, structure, those structural inequalities do violence upon individuals. Not because of, of what your individual choices are, because we're not focusing on the individual. We're looking at that broader structure of society. And that really is where the problem lies. Because in this context, those vast differences are really engineered into the very fabric of Brazilian society. And your skin color, if you're born in a favela, is likely to be significantly darker than your skin color if you're born in an upper class element or portion of Brazilian society. And likewise, does anybody recognize this photo in here? This is a Union Carbide plant in Bhopal, India, um, which really um, was one of the most significant industrial disasters in, in human history. Um, basically, the carbide plant released some toxic gas that rolled down and um, caused several thousand deaths within a, a small village um, that was situated in and near this, this center. Those individuals that grew up in that rural village um, in India had no more choice in where they were born from, but they were there because they were fitting in the lowest social economic class within Indian society, which drew their labor to that really that concentrated industrial setting that put them at risk. The individuals that lost their life in there lost their life because they were a product of an exploitive structural system that drew them into a position of danger. Somebody who was born in an upper class setting or one of the higher castes in Indian society would have never been placed in such a dangerous position that the structure of society could do violence upon them. And that really is the importance of recognizing this term. And that's kind of what I'm going to be focusing on when we talk about the nature of, of sort of the historical landscape here in Grand Rapids as it pertains to uh, the interaction between racial and ethnic groups. A lot of what you're, you're hearing at the Race and Ethnicity Conference are talking about issues such as poverty, or issues such as education, or issues such as prejudice and access or unequal access to jobs and that. Really what we're describing to you, um, if you listen to um, Dr. Williams' talk, which started off the conference on Monday, he gave up a, a lot of, of the statistical backgrounds um, that really is a statistical portrayal of the structural inequalities engineered into not just American society, but Grand Rapids society as well. In that instance, if we can talk about one manifestation of structural inequalities, poverty, instead of focusing on poverty, we have to recognize it for what it is. It's a symptom of those inequalities. It's not the cause of the inequalities themselves. So disproportionately, when we have discussions of this, what is the problem? Well, we just got to just sort of raise the income level. But the income is a symptom. You can't treat symptoms without looking at the underlying causes that produce them in the first place. In the same way, in terms of that conversation between those two white school teachers trying to figure out why there was differences in the educational system here in Grand Rapids. What they're talking about was not a problem of education. What they're talking about was a symptom of the structural inequalities engineered into American society. Um, and so in this sense, and we can look at a number of different stats or, or data, and I'm an anthropologist, so we don't, heavy, or don't go heavy on the stats. Uh, but basically, if you're born into a condition of poverty, you're likely to die in a condition of poverty. Uh, your ability to have access to education, access to good paying jobs, you're more or less likely to end up in whatever class you start with. Um, and, and my students in here, sort of, a, this is almost like a broken record at times. But basically, if you're born lower class, you're going to die lower class. If you're born middle class, you're going to die middle class. If you're born upper class, unless you do something really dumb, you're going to die upper class. That's the structure of the system within our country. Can individuals move out? Yeah. But I don't care about individuals in this context. I'm talking about the structure. So we'll focus on one individual that can move up from lower class to middle class, or maybe even up to upper class. That's an individual. But of that one individual, nine of them are going to end up in the exact same position in that structural system that they started out within. And so then it's just a simple philosophy 101. If you're likely, if you're born into poverty, that you're likely to stay and die in poverty, and B, if minorities are disproportionately born into impoverished settings, then C, or A equals C. That minorities themselves are gonna be disproportionate to the rest of society, born into a condition of poverty, and because of the structural inequalities that dis uh, restrict access to any of those elements that a, a sort of a dignified human being needs is they're going to finish in that context. Not because of who they are, not because of how smart they are, not because of how hard you work, not because of talent, but 
because that there's inequalities in exploitive social um, and power relationships engineered into the very fabric of our society. And that's the process that's going on uh, within this. I'm trying to think of time. If you look at this chart, this is from the most recent census data here. Um, and these are non-metro counties. And so uh, basically counties in the United States that have a high poverty rate. So we're looking at 20% or more in poverty, in poverty rate. Um, if we look at the geographic distribution of these um, counties, what we see is a huge belt down around here uh, and here and then the light green ones there and then this area here. And we can correlate those with the predominant uh, racial or ethnic group that identifies themselves on census data. So in the deep south, we have predominantly African American communities that are born and, and sort of, of and stuck in this, this impoverished situation. We have predominantly Hispanic communities in, in West Texas and New Mexico. These are Native American communities, including some of the Ogala Sioux reservations, which are the poorest counties in the United States. And that has a legacy that goes even farther back, but I'm not gonna sort of touch upon that into this narrative. With that said, We'll see if this works really well. I'm stealing New York Times uh, stuff, but I'm giving reference, so it's, it's called citations. This is a map of income benefits re received by county in the United States. Um, this came in with a lot of some of the, the sort of the, the political discussion that was going on in, in regards to um, individuals utilizing um, a larger social safety net or a restricted social safety net. Um, the politics of that discussion aside, I'm using this as illustrative purposes to link together history and structural inequalities. And so this is in 2009, which is the most recent data that we have in. Um, and I selected really the income support benefits because um, there's actually a whole host of government benefits that will we'll talk about different things. But this primarily focuses on poverty. These are individuals that qualify for low income food stamps and disability payments and, and so on and so on. Um, and so if you can see the dark areas here um, and here, over and here, that reflect those counties that receive the uh, disproportionate majority of those benefits, um, those correlate very, very well with that map um, that I showed before since it's pulled from the same data, it should, right? Um, and what we talked about was, these are, we're talking about poverty as a symptom, but what we're talking about is that impoverished um, inequalities disproportionately will affect individuals on the basis of their skin color or, or ethnic identification rather than everybody equally. But the thing of the note is really looking at how this changes over time. So what we've done is we have expanded the opportunity to have benefits. But if we go back to 1969, which is the first period that we have data from, this map shows the distribution of the poorest counties in the United States, which are concentrated here, 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 and here. And then we can move forward and see what 40 years has an effect on people. And what we see is nothing's changed. That individuals that are born in an impoverished context in 1969 are going to be living in an impoverished context in 2009. Their life experiences were set for them at birth not because of hard work, not because of effort, but because of the very inequalities that are engineered into the fabric or the structure of American society that affords individuals that are born on a low rung in these exploitive social relationships are gonna die in those exact same positions in society. Thank the New York Times for being able to illustrate that for me better than I could, um, since I have a static map. So what happened? How do we get to the point where I can follow behind two somewhat educated individuals that are members of um, sort of, of probably would presumably to be an active middle class with here in Grand Rapids society and they fail to grasp the nature of that system? At what point did we get to the point where we fail to recognize the importance of structural inequalities and their impact on people's lives and the experiences and the dispro disproportionate experiences of individuals? Um, what I'm going to kind of focus on today is I'm going to talk about three processes that probably came about that produced that effect where we've really forgotten the impact of those structural inequalities. And, with the, and then what I'm going to try to do is, is bring that back together and talk about the implications of forgetting the importance of structural inequalities. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the production of dominant historical narratives. 
Uh, not to pick on Professor Light back there about the importance of history, but uh, what I'm going to be talking about is really looking at the production of historical narratives. Because to understand the effect of structural injustices in a society, you have to understand the historical background that leads to their production in the first place. However, one of the reasons why we don't see them or we don't think of structural inequalities is because our narratives are produced to obfuscate them, to remove them from sight. Um, and once you remove them from sight, then there's no problem, right? We sweep it underneath the rug, and it looks like my bedroom was when I called it clean. The second processes that occurs is this effect of, I uh, talk about also forgetting, but marginalizing alternative narratives. So we're going to talk about the role of power producing historical narrative. And then what we're going to talk about is the role of um, alternative narratives being marginalized to the side. And so when they're given voice, they're given voice in a restrictive context that or prohibits them from really having a true effect on causing structural changes. Because again, you can talk about stuff and change the individual actors in history. You can change the fate of individuals, which is great, but that doesn't change the fact that there is unequal power relationships between groups of people engineered into the structure of society. And then finally, I just made up this word, but we're going to go with it, um, is ahistoricizing discussions of inequality and diversity. And that really is the, the effect that I talked about with this difference between um, the school teachers walking out of Ronald Ferguson's talk um, and their inability to grasp really the, the, the nature and the, really the true source or cause of the differences in education quality between certain schools and, and certain parts of, of the Grand Rapids, the greater Grand Rapids school system. Um, and so um, historicizing, I think, is a word. I just put the letter A in front of it to talk about the absence of historicizing. Um, in other words, when we remove history from the consideration of these, what we're able to do is focus on a problem, yet forget and ignore responsibility for the production of the problem in the first place. And that becomes a, a key part in terms of, of why we, we should be in this classroom or this lecture hall today, is recognizing that we do have responsibility for problems. But if we remove that production from history, then we can also disassociate ourselves from any sort of, of obligation or moral responsibility to that. So I'm going to sort of hopefully briefly uh, talk about these three processes here. Um, I'm drawing primarily on the work of two individuals in terms of talking about the production of history as a narrative and talking about the role of power within the production of, of history. And so um, the work of, of Michel Trollio, uh, he's an anthropologist that focuses on uh, historical narratives, predominantly in, in Haiti. And then Eric Wolf, another uh, anthropologist that is focused on the overall uh, interaction and the forgetting of uh, structural uh, sort of exploitive practices that have affected uh, different groups of people really on a global scale. So the difference is where we get a British officer watching workmen in a particular part of the world, really talking about the colonial <laughs> experience and really what Wolf in, in his text, um, Europe and the People Without History, which I shamefully uh, stole his, his part of his title from my, my talk, is really talking about how is it that we get gross inequalities between the first world and the third world, which we're not going to focus on since we're going to keep this local today, um, but really the basis and the, the sort of the theoretical basis from it um, is partly we have an exploitive world economic system that has come about that produces those inequalities. But the same process as Eric Wolf talks about, when you deny history, what you're doing is you're denying the ability of one group of people to voice itself and voice itself as a, a predominant narrative. Um, and more importantly, uh, Dr. Troliot's uh, talk on silencing the past. What he talks about is when you look at history, you got to look at how history is produced. Um, and we all have a cliche, history is produced by the victors. Everybody kind of just sort of chuckles at it and has an idea. But it's true. And so what are the dynamics that lead to the disproportionate production of historical narratives? First off, there's this issue of the sources that we draw historical documents from. Those are disproportionately produced. Uh, in fact, how many people do you think in the United States in 1700, maybe Doc, or Professor Light can talk about this, how many people in the 1750s were able to write? Were literate. You want me to guess? <laughs> Take one guess. Just give me a guess here. How many were literate? I'm going to say less than 20%. So less than 20%. Of those 20%, do you think that was 
evenly distributed across all segments of you know, American society? Absolutely not. Absolutely. See, I got a, a professional historian here to back up every uh, overgeneralization I do. That's the best way to do, give a talk. We're doing a good job then. <laughs> all right, thank you very much. Yeah, and so the very production of historical documents that we produce historical narratives from are unequally produced in the first place. In other words, their silence is built into the historical record. In addition, all those people that are trying to write and write and produce documents in 1750, we probably only have a fraction of those preserved and cataloged and indexed in archives to have access to. And we generally only favor those individuals that have had a privileged access within a society. And so based on those two phenomenon, we get a very narrow view of history. And that history is disproportionately being produced by one group that is generally in a privileged position of exploiting other groups of people, either politically, economically, socially, um, or whatnot. We can go through that whole list that I had on that slide that was turning through. That's the production of history. That's just in the source documents. Then somebody who's a historian's got to produce that history. And what they're not producing is an undisputable fact. Historians produce a narrative. We call it historical narrative. We, we offer it as an academic truth, but it's a narrative nonetheless. They're backing it up in different ways with different sorts of evidences that separate it from fiction. But in anyone, anybody who's ever tried to tell a story to a friend, how much stuff do you end up leaving out? A lot. Because you just can't feasibly do it. And so the producer of that narrative must make a decision on what to exclude from the production of that narrative. And so when we combine all these sequences of silencing, we see a, dis a restricted access of what documents are produced in the first place. We see a very restricted access of what documents um, are being preserved and available for study. And then we see a restricted access of how that narrative gets told and what parts of those documents are being accentuated in the production of that historical narrative. That is really built into all of this. Yet, when we talk about and we think about a historic landscape or a history of a group of people or a history of a region, we tend to look at it as it's history. We teach it in college, which we should. And it gives us a really good, important look on it. And you should take Professor Light's class if you can't. It's a good plug, right? <laughs> Yet what we need to be aware of is the role of that selective production of history and what effect it has on groups that don't have equal voice. And so every historical document has silences built into it. And it's not the dominant group in a society that is silenced. It's the selective silencing of people that have an alternative narrative that might counteract or dispute whatever the structural injustices that are engineered into society are in the first place. And so we can turn to history now. Uh, we can talk about uh, Heritage Hill, which is sort of the beacon of history here in Grand Rapids. We're on Heritage Hill. Um, my office is on Heritage Hill. Um, I live in Heritage Hill. Um, I'm Heritage Hill. I'm a highly educated white male between the ages of 18 and 35. And I live in a historic district. Um, I am the embodiment of power within Grand Rapids society. This kind of gives me a trip. I just like saying that out loud. Um, Sort of, I'll give reference, I, I stole these off of heritagehillwebsites.org, but technically I'm a member because I live in the district, so I'm using my own stuff, I guess. Um, and that was the first historic piece of information I was told to when I first was looking at where to live in Grand Rapids. When I was first actually interviewing here, people take me around, oh, this is Heritage Hill. This is really the pinnacle of historic preservation within the city of Grand Rapids, and this preserves the un undisputed history of Grand Rapids society, Heritage Hill. Whose heritage is it? White. Upper white furniture barons. And so what we're looking at is the disproportionate or selective preservation of sources. If we think about historic buildings, and every building that was built past a certain period of time is technically historic, we just simply tend to accentuate one historic building over another historic building because we infuse all this other stuff into it. But what we're doing is we're selectively silencing the history of a whole segment of Grand Rapids society because we tend to favor 
one element or one sort of prestigious side of society over another side. The importance, the historical information that we can pull from Heritage Hill is no more or no less than what we can pull from other neighborhoods here in Grand Rapids. But the problem is, what is deemed historical is selective. And it's that silence and that production of history. I kind of joke that this talk's going to get me kicked out of Heritage Hill. Um, and so what we end up doing is we're forgetting that these homes were built by essentially lumber barons. And they made their capital, their money, to finance the construction of these homes by holding big furniture mills that themselves were purchasing cheap labor that were generally of minority racial and ethnic groups within Grand Rapids society. So the very <coughs> labor of the groups that are being silenced was actually used to finance the capital to build the homes in Heritage Hill. And then who built the homes themselves? Do you think it was the upper, upper class lumber baron that constructed the house in the first place? Why don't we have a preserved history of the laborers that went into building the homes? Or a preserved history of the individuals that serviced the homes? Why don't we have a narrative about the range of experiences of the residents of Heritage Hill that were living here immediately prior to gentrification? Their voice as a source of history is every bit as rich and every bit of a historical document as the voices of the individuals that now basically control Heritage Hill. And I'm not, I'm not saying anything problem with that. I love the preservation of historic houses. I'm an archaeologist. I love old stuff. But what we need to do is be aware of these processes of silencing that are built into it. Because what we tend to do is we exclude the whole history of groups of people. In fact, I work in Stuart Edward White Hall. Uh, this is probably going to get my job fired. That's why I had Steve pick me up. But that's the whitest name you can come up with. Stuart Edward White. And so what we have is the silences that are built within even this sort of the gemstone of, of Grand Rapids history. Um, I did a little bit of research because I like having numbers. Um, and so I went through a survey of all the state historical markers that are registered for the city of Grand Rapids. There are 62 historical markers registered with the state that have uh, National Register of Historic Place uh, significance for most of these as well. 14 of them only had really any sort of distinctive racial or ethnic descriptive with it. Um, however, whatever 62 minus 14 is, I can't do math very well. Um, the difference with them is really those, those historic markers have an implicit dominant white heritage with it as well. So you still have a disproportionate preservation. So if you're out in a community and you see plaques, what you're doing is showing the accentuation of one historical narrative and the, the silencing of somebody else's historical narrative, even if you're not going out of your way to read those. How many people have seen a plaque and walked by it and never read it? But I guarantee, I bet you could give me a 20 second synopsis of what I was talking about. Uh, such and such rich person was living in that nice big architectural home right there. And you move on. Because it doesn't tell you about all these other elements and historical narratives within Grand Rapids society that have been silenced. And so, going back, forward. There we go. So we have 12 of them referencing white European ancestry, the most prevalent um, ethnic identification. Surprise, surprise. Um, we actually have two that mention various uh, uh, Anishinaabe groups. Um, as you see, these won't add up because there's actually one that references both a white Euro-American ancestry and um, references an Anishinaabe heritage, and that's for Louis Campo, um, whose house is like right there, um, who's obviously recognized as the founding uh, sort of, of individual for Grand Rapids history. And his plaque talks about not just his French ancestry, but also how, why he set up a trading post to interact with the local Anishinaabe. Um, and so you get sort of one group, but the Anishinaabe within those state register plaques are usually in a subordinate position. You have a French fur trader that is basically exploiting them, and they're marginalized within the context of that historical marker. The other one that's registered for the state is talking about Slater's Mission, which is another Euro-American settlement that came about and it was basically um, marginalizing the, the sort of the focal point on the on Anishinaabe heritage. By Anishinaabe, I'm talking about the, the Native American groups that were, were present here. Only one mentions anything to do with, with a, a sort of a black history to it. Um, it's a Grand Rapids Study Club, which I have no idea even where it is. Um, but what they talk about is not so much the building itself, which is, is registered by the state as the Paul Richens House, but in the historical narrative of the text, it talks about the role of the Grand Rapids Study Club for uh, social activization, or activism um, and the preservation of sort of black literacy. Um, in contrast, while there's one marker in the state register that mentions a black heritage, 
there are four markers in Grand Rapids that preserve bridges. So what does that tell you about the relative importance of different narratives within Grand Rapids society? Um, although there are three markers um, that are not registered with the state that do have, obviously, prevalence down on the riverbed. And stemming from the S-curve project, there has been really a, a distinctive of, um, focus on Anishinaabeg history, which is actually really great. And this is one place where Grand Rapids definitely needs to be applauded at. There's a marker from a Michigan legal milestone talking about the ending of Jim Crow laws, uh, which was uh, the, the victory of, of um, Oliver Green um, against the, the Supreme Court to, to say that uh, black individuals in Grand Rapids could actually sit down on the main floor of a theater. Um, and so, um, although one court said they couldn't, um, another court said they could, uh, thankfully for that. And so, um, that was the, the Emmett Fulton case. Um, and so, the, the Michigan uh, Legal or the Bar Association has preserved that, that cast. Um, I find it ironic that they, they focus on, I think, 1925 as the ending of Jim Crow laws here in Grand Rapids, because I'm sure any historian or anybody that wants a Google search can find any innumerable instances of the preservation of Jim Crow attitudes in Grand Rapids that extend well beyond the official ending of them as dictated by the, the Grand Rapids Bar Association. Not to pick on them, and it's great that they focus on that court case, and then we have Rosa Parks Circles. And so what we see here is a mixture of historical sources and historical points that really, if you just a, are a casual observer in Grand Rapids history, and we all are unless we're delving into documents, we're exposed to this. Every one of you that grew up in Grand Rapids has walked by those plaques all the time. And what gets built in the back of your head is that understanding that there's a selective preservation of one historical narrative that is valued more so than alternative historical narratives. Um, and part of that is the frequency and the facetiousy that you tend to see each of those. And that's the production of history within Grand Rapids society. And that's the problem, and that's one of the processes I talked about that have ultimately led to those teachers struggling to frame inequalities between groups of people in a historical context because we've disproportionately focused on one history. And the white lumber baron history here in Grand Rapids does not want to talk about their ability to exploit cheap labor of subordinate racial and minority groups because that just doesn't sound very good in nice parties. Um, and so what you tend to do is you tend to ignore that and forget that. The other part of it is how you treat alternative narratives within this structural system. And so what you end up having are what um, a lot of anthropologists are calling blue box issues. Um, so anybody in here who's been forced to, to open a textbook, I'm not going to say buy a textbook, but open a textbook, um, and what you look at is you, know, you read the main narrative text, which is selective, but then there'll be a little box on the side, usually in blue, sometimes it's different colors. They've been mixing it up since people have been talking about blue box issues. They'll talk about gender issues or race and ethnicity issues. How many got a textbook that has that type of pattern to it? Yeah. And so what you do is you have your dominant narrative, and then you push off to the side in a restricted, bounded box that you set aside with color to talk about the alternative narrative. And then you flip the page, and you can go back to your dominant discussion of what's going on in whatever particular issue from a very selective perspective, because that's being produced in order to silence other parts. And when you're forced to, to verbalize and vocalize an alternative narrative, what you want to do is marginalize it. So we tend to talk about Black History Month only for a month. We talk about Women's History Month the next month for a month. Uh, we have books on the African American history of Grand Rapids, which is an excellent book, but that doesn't point out the fact that why do we need a separate narrative about it when the history of Grand Rapids should integrate all these different stories and all these different threads if it was being produced right in the first place. But it's not. And so what you need to do is you need to set aside um, and more or less reserve discussion of those topics. And so that's the second major thread or the major phenomenon that's occurring that permit or sort of, of enculturates individuals to be incapable of articulating that historical basis to structural inequalities between one group of people and another group of people. And the final one is um, this ahistoricizing term. Um, and really, it's, it's how we treat discussions of inequality um, and, and racial and ethnic uh, sort of, of um, issues and well. Um, and part of it factors into this difference between individual experiences and the structural inequalities that I've been talking about. Um, and for a case in point, what sort of have hammered me home here in Grand Rapids 
was focal point at, or was what occurred at the diversity lecture series. Um, and I put this disclaimer here because I'm offering this as a cautionary tale for all of us, and I'm not offering this as a critique of the diversity lecture series, because I think it's awesome. Um, and if you haven't gone to one yet, you should go to each and every one that you have a chance to go to. And so, um, in addition, I'm going to talk about individuals such as Bob and Alicia Woodrick, who have founded and financed the Diversity Learning Center. Um, Bob Woodrick is definitely one of my heroes in terms of, I, I don't know him, um, but what he's done here in Grand Rapids is wonderful. And so while I'm talking about him, I'm not doing anything to critique him per se. What I'm talking about is the overall structure of the situation, or Steelcase Corporation, which has done a lot of great things. Um, and so I'm putting my plug in, I'm not critiquing Steelcase Corporation either. I'm trying to make that as clear as possible to the camera. Because um, that'll get me kicked out of my job pretty quickly too. Um, but I walked into the first diversity lecture series um, and sat down. Um, and it's here in the, the Fountain Street Church, which is this opulent church. Um, I'm sure we could do a historical background of the race and ethnicity of all the members of the Fountain Street Church that have donated money. And I guarantee we're going to get a very privileged sample of, of Grand Rapids society. So you're in this opulent temple to the dominant ethnic group within Grand Rapids. And you have this diversity lecture series that's focusing on discussions of, of inequality and diversity. And for the first 20 minutes of this talk was this litany of individuals that being thanked um, and this parade of essentially thanking white, upper class individuals from a dominant position in society that more or less have, have produced their income um, within this context of structural inequalities that are being thanked for financing this before you even get to the main point to talk about diversity. And that's not a problem of the, the, the lecture series, because those issues need to be talked about. But what those issues are talking about are individual experiences that are lived and experienced today. And that's one way that we need to treat issues such as, as inequality and diversity, is talking about the experiences of people that face it on a daily basis. Uh, that's one side of it. However, if that's all we talk about, if we remove history, from this discussion and only focus on the lived experiences of people in the contemporary context, and nobody points out that they find it odd that in a diversity lecture series, we basically have a litany of white upper class in terms of, of economic advantage, thanking for the financing of it. We're not, what we're doing is we're ignoring the historically rooted structural inequalities that have produced those differences and the need for a diversity lecture series in the first place. And that's the problem. And that's ultimately the third process that leads to the inability of individuals walking out of a talk about the achievement gap within schools here in Grand Rapids and their inability to situate the origins of that achievement gap in a historical basis. And so instead, what you end up with is the second person talking or describing the symptom of a structural inequality. Well, it's just that's where the parents move their children to because they want to go to good schools. And that leaves behind, presumably, bad students. Are the students that are being left behind bad? That's the problem with removing that, that historical basis to it. And so basically what I was focusing on, um, actually I'm going to go ahead to here and then come back to that. And so this is my response to those teachers that I wasn't able to, actually I did it in like 50 minutes, so that was a lot quicker than my, my hour long shaking on the neck. Um, and so what I should have done, was sort of interjecting myself in that conversation. So instead of, but what I don't understand is where do those differences or the inequalities between access to education come from in the first place? Uh, and so what unnamed white male teacher C walking behind teachers A and B should have said <laughs> is that the differences in equality or in quality of the school systems are just a symptom. They're not a cause, as we often tend to focus on. Well, if we just give better education, then everything will be right. That's not the problem. The problem is the inequalities engineered and the fact that people have a disproportionate experience based simply on where they're born. And the problem is you're more likely to have that disproportionate or unequal experience if you're born with darker skin color than another group of people. And that's just absolutely ridiculous. And so what we see is that's just a symptom of the inequalities that are present. Um, and those are ultimately historically rooted and we can go back to the colonial era. Why do we have a difference in the, the experiences and access to income, uh, wealth, education, power, prestige, 
any of those within American society. Well, we can see that at the very, very founding of the United States, we had a disproportionate control of the social, political, and economic capital within American society by white Europeans. And they brought over slaves from Africa. Um, and so if you're built into a system where you're already marginalized and a point where you are just sort of pushed to the side as worst as can be possible and not paid for your labor anyway, even if you end slavery, that doesn't change the fact that your labor is now able to be cheaply exploited by somebody in a privileged position. And by their ability to cheaply exploit that labor, that means that you are not going to have access to a fair wage compared to what somebody else has access to. And once you create that system, as I showed with the New York Times um, sort of schematic, once you lock that into place, it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how ingenious you are, how talented you are. If you're born in that poor, exploitive context, you're going to die in that poor, exploitive context because that's the structure of the system that is engineered there in the first place. And educational gaps between one school system and another school system is just a symptom of that. It's not the cause of that. And that's where they come from ultimately. They don't just come out of nowhere. Unfortunately, we've forgotten this, and we tend to frame this system in ahistorical terms and talk about contemporary differences between individuals. And that's fine. And we need to be talking about the experiences and the different experiences between individuals of different visible um, skin color. However, that doesn't absolve us from the fact that we also need to recognize that those do not come about at random, that those came about from a very distinct historical trajectory that have continually for the entire history of our country, privileged one group of people over another group of people. And that has locked individuals into place. And so that individuals born in certain segments of American society have no more chance to get out of that than an individual born in a poor favela in Brazilian society does. Because it's not the individual experience that's lived. It's the nature of those structural inequalities that are engineered into that in the first place. Um, and so basically, how do we get to that point? Well, that's what a structural equality is. And it's the production of historical narratives by selectively sampling sources that allow us to ignore the existence of those inequalities in the first place. It's the forgetting and the marginalizing of, of alternative narratives that keep them from voicing in opposition um, to the, the, the nature of the structure. And then it's the fact that, again, we tend to focus on individual elements of uh, of this, this dynamic than we do on terms of, of issues of structural inequalities. So much so, I'm having a discussion in one of my online classes, and individuals are talking about um, ethnic boundaries and sort of the, the difference within them. Um, and all too often, it's the students that, if I look on the little photo roster that are phenotypically white, are talking that, hey, you know what, we, we've seen less discrimination, and that's true. Be but the experiences of you are a little, and I'm not picking on, on the students because that's just simply the, the nature of your experiences. And if you're born in a white middle class setting, you don't experience discrimination. And if you don't experience it, you're not aware of it. And you don't recognize it happening. And then I can turn around and I can read the posts from any one of my students that ha are visibly of color, and they portray a very distinctly different perspective of American society. One in which they're designed access to jobs because of their skin color. The one in which they have to endure looks upon them um, that deny them dignity in those contexts which are all elements of structural inequalities. So we tend to focus and ahistoricize that and not recognize where the origins of that were in the first place. Which we get to the final little part, and I got done early since uh, I don't want to be up past 9 o'clock anyway, it's my bedtime. Um, is the so what? Most of you are going to multiple uh, race and ethnicity uh, talks. Most of you have probably gone to um, or have sat through a class that have touched upon these subjects. Um, and when we ahistoricize it and we deny the discussion of history and structural inequalities into it, it's easy for us to set onto the side and say, you need to work harder. Or, you know, I'm not prejudiced. I treat everybody equally. And you might. You might. And that's fine. Uh, in fact, as I've been talking with di different people today, if we ended prejudice, if every single one of us in American society stopped being uh, racist, not so much, I'm not calling anybody racist, but if you stopped looking at and creating a stereotype or looking at somebody differently because of their skin color, if we stopped that all today, it wouldn't change the fact 
that because of that structure of the system, that one group of people, based on their skin color, is going to have disproportionate or unequal access to all those anyway. So if you eliminate how we interact with each other, it doesn't change the problem. And so that's where um, sort of the challenge of the so what of this is. Why do I give this? Because I like talking about structure. I, I said structural inequalities like 900 times, I think. But it's not because of that. Because what I see in terms of discussions of race and ethnicity issues is oftentimes this way to disassociate individual responsibility. I'm not prejudiced, and you might not be. But that still does not absolve you from any responsibility in the fact that built into the system that allows you access to a good job, to well-paying income, to a nice home, to education, is the exact same system that denies that same access to somebody else on affording on the basis of their skin, color, or ethnic identity. And that's a problem. And so while you can stop being prejudiced, which you should, and I'm sure everybody in here is, it still doesn't resolve our responsibility into trying to figure out how to, to decrease those gaps. Um, and that's where I just want to finish up by applauding those two school teachers that went to the talk. So even though they were sort of grasping and able to describe sort of the nature or the really the root cause of those achievement gaps or the inequalities in education, they still wanted to do something about it. That's why they were there. They wanted to be able to sort of deal with and reduce some of those structural inequalities that are engineered in a society. And so again, just try to think about as you go through um, discussions of race and ethnicity, not just in, in this week in terms of the conference or if it touch upon any one of your classes. And if you find yourself coming back to, I'm not prejudiced, that's great, but so what? There's still work to do. Thank you. If anybody has a question, Dr. Carr will be happy to answer a question. And uh, we want to get this on tape, so wait for me to get to you with the microphone so it'll be recorded. I'm giving the camera guys work up. I'm just going to go up yeah. here. And then... uh, I, I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, you, brought up, you brought up a lot of great. Um, topics that I'm very interested in, but uh, you didn't mention in your talk um, sis systems of government at all, and I just wanted to bring up um, capitalism versus socialism. Uh, I, I, think, I, yep. I think you were kind of leading to that a little bit um, with the, your reference to structural um, inequality, but um, I've, I've had the uh, uh, very, I've been very lucky to be able to travel in Europe, to be mm -hmm. traveling, to go to Canada. And when you go to socialist countries like Canada uh, throughout Europe, uh, right away you notice they have much more integrated societies um, than we do here. And um, you also notice that the most desirable places to live in those countries are right in the centers of the city. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the United States, which I think is changing quickly, but still the desirable places to live are in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. And our center cities are still largely where the minor, poor minority families live. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I myself would argue that um, because of that, the European countries and Canada, uh, it is in their interest as socialist countries to try to integrate their mm -hmm. populations as much as, po as possible, uh, which would explain the integration that I've seen. Mm -hmm. And as a capitalist country, it is not in our interest to promote integration or equality because we're a money-based society. We, we are a society that operates on, um, on honoring, honoring the wealthy and saying, too bad you didn't make it, and, and, uh, and preserving that mm -hmm. structure. Um, I, I, that's what I see. So um, I just wondered, was it a conscious choice not to get into the political structure or? Um, <laughs> That's a really, I'm going to try to unpack that question since it's, there's a lot loaded into it. Um, one, I don't like to talk about politics during an election cycle, uh, just because it kind of, everybody gets all rabid and sort of, but uh, it was a good question in terms of, of talking about the differences in, say, a socialist model within a European government. Um, with that said, and you're contrasting socialism and capitalism, the problem is that the European countries um, are capitalist. Um, and so, Really, when we look at the, the economic system underwriting the political structures in a society, there's no different. And a lot of the same processes are plagued in European countries. This talked about Greece, how well that's going on. 
um, with that. In addition, um, you're right in observing the differences between the quality of, of sort of, I guess, life within urban centers versus it is here in, in the United States. Um, and so if you can look at, say, downtown Stockholm versus downtown Detroit, there's a very distinctly different experience that's being afforded with that. Yet, if you pick up a newspaper from, I think, last summer, you look at a lot of, of essentially race and ethnic-based riots among Islamic um, sort of immigrants into not just um, sort of, a, not just one, one society within the European Union, but multiple. And France kind of jumps to mind, but Britain certainly has its, its own share of problems with that. In the Scandinavian countries, that's, that tension is there, um, and it's still festering sort of underneath. They just happen to have, it hasn't exploded in the sense that it has in other parts of uh, European countries. And not just Islamic individuals, it's individuals of Eastern European descent, because there's very much that class-based idea behind the, the, the industrialized original core of the European Union and the non-industrial sort of agrarian periphery um, of, of the European Union. Um, and that tension is very much there. And, and plus, any individual that emigrated back to Europe from former colonial possessions, that's really where a lot of those differences are. So with that said, they have a socialist model of government that provides a lot more in a different array of services, which um, I personally am, am a lot more for because I, I do love extending um, governance to it. But the system or the structure of the system is identical. Um, and they have the identical series of problems because what you form is, is essentially boundaries between groups of people. We tend to sort of consolidate um, groups into more inner city contexts, and we, we focus on our suburbs because of the American ideal of space, whereas Europe tends to urbanize and then tends to push individuals into peripheries. You see that with the favelas in, in Rio de Janeiro as well, where the, the inner core is really the upper class side of it and the privilege points and hilltops and on the margins of those major urban centers. And really any urban center outside the United States is where the, the really the poor, and, and, and when I say poor, is, is generally sort of a marginalized racial or ethnic group. So uh, great question. Um, you're focusing on the, the right issues, but um, I would say that Europe is, is definitely not the model um, for it. Carolyn. Yeah, I was just wondering, so do you think that the key to fixing the problem is to kind of change our idea of what we think of as infrastructure as far as like support for the poor? I'm thinking like healthcare and public transportation and all those kind of things that make life easier if those were bigger and more, you know, well thought out infrastructures, would mm -hmm. that change things? I, absolutely. Um, I, I, I think that that ultimately, and then Again, that's something that we can borrow from that, that European model, is if we extend certain things, and what we have to do is just be conscious about how we do it, because any one decision of where do we build a, a bus line, mm -hmm. um, where do we build that, is going to cause essentially structural violences to one group or another group of individuals. One issue that comes to mind is, is the issue of, of bus route and bus route planning in parts of Florida. And so what they tend to do is they plot bus route and bus stops down in middle parts of these big six lane highways, and the edges of the, or the, the crosswalks are a quarter mile or a half mile away. And those bus stops are being planned by essentially a suburban um, white individual that drives to work. So he doesn't use the bus system. And so what you tend to do is you're finding where you're dropping off essentially um, poor individuals that um, are taking the bus because that's their mode of transportation. And they're stuck a quarter mile from each crosswalk. And so what they try to do is they try to cross the highway because their destination, instead of walking a quarter mile down, across the big six lane highway a quarter mile up to get to their destination, they try to make a go for it. And so you, you actually find a, a great deal of um, sort of, of traffic accidents and deaths that is disproportionately affecting one group than another group because it is really just terrible planning of, of bus lines. And so the infrastructure is the answer, but it's not so much this, all right, if we just cast out this safety net, so to speak, it really isn't gonna cause really that much change because what we need to do is, is recognize where the holes in those nets are and sort of, of um, do some sort of, of very local on the ground uh, planning to ensure that what people need in order to get them out of a context is what they're getting. Um, when I talk about sort of, of global poverty and those issues in, in my classrooms, that's one of the problems with, with global aid is people try to provide aid and they're good natured about it, but what they're providing to people is actually not what the local people want or need. Um, and so that's part of the issue. Infrastructure definitely helps. Um, and the European model with, with providing healthcare and all that kind of stuff does bring up the overall quality of life for individuals in a lower context. But providing um, transportation and other things that give them access to an economic sector 
uh, will disproportionately favor one group or another group. And, and so the challenge then is to try to figure out what the best fit for, for that is without unduly sort of, of tipping the balance one way or another. Um, and you know, the biggest answer for that is to increase a, a domestic economy. So when times are going great, it's going great for everybody. So um, when you're in a recession, it usually goes bad for everybody. But it's how you experience that recession is different. So if you can't afford a, a $4 million mansion and you have to get the $3 million mansion, it's all right. Um, but if you're forced to uh, sort of car payment or um, bus line, that kind of stuff, it's going to have an impact on your life. And so part of it is really sort of, because um, I, I don't like to go on camera and say capitalism is wrong, that kind of stuff, because then people say, oh, he's inciting re rebellion or anything like that, which I don't want to do. Um, but within a capitalist model, without changing essentially a capitalist uh, thing, if we look at the way in which uh, the flows of capital are at being accessible and, um, and working their way down to individuals, then that creates the ability, like you said, for infrastructural developments where we can actually improve the condition if we're intentional about it. Um, and that's kind of the point of the talk is, if we're not aware of the problem in terms of those structural inequalities, we can't be intentional about it. So whether it's public transportation, whether it's better education, whether it's funding associate professor of anthropology positions at, at community colleges, which would be a great um, sort of a value for the money, right? Um, you know, whatever it may be, um, we need to flow that in and target um, to where it it's, can do the most good. Awesome. Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out so late um, to hear me talk. Thank you. Let's give another round of applause to Dr. Kittle and Carr.